Fabulous. Hi, evening, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, first of all, thanks to uh, Northland School for hosting. Uh, appreciate that. Teas and coffees. And for those online, I hope you're well. Uh, if you can't hear me or see me at any point or the screen sharing stops, drop us a message and we will uh, try and endeavour to sort that. Uh, my name is Daniel James. Um, I'm an independent consultant supporting um, uh, in my career at the moment, a lot of the uh, interconnect and development in, in the North Sea as well as worldwide. And uh, going to cover a few topics today, principally around how the UK and also the rest of the world is uh, looking to strengthen its energy security, uh, the business opportunities that come with that, uh, the market availability with um, high voltage direct current interconnectors, um, touch on wind farms and offshore platforms regarding then. Uh, the, the growth in that market and how interconnection is going to support that, as well as then uh, the fact that these cables are transporting electricity hundreds of hundreds of miles um, across uh, the open seas, um, what capacity they've got, and the principally then the installation challenges, which is sort of the uh, the tie-in principally with, with mechanical engineering, marine engineering. Um, and how, how we're supporting this industry as a whole. Um, we'll cover a little bit of the cable design um, in its basics, but principally looking then at the mechanical handling, uh, the offshore vessels and the installation tools, uh, burial trenches, the challenges that come with that and how we want to make sure that these cables are protected um, for, for the entirety of their uh, operational life. Uh, and we'll cover a little bit of what happens and what it looks like when it goes wrong. Um, to make sure that we try not to, uh, to make that happen in the future. I realise that I'm flipping through slides, but it's not changing on. It's odd. One second, apologies. I read a slide that you guys couldn't see. That one. So that's what I just said. <laughs> apologies, you couldn't read that at the same time. But um, briefly about me, uh, upbringing wise, I'm lucky enough to live abroad, uh, Malawi in the Middle East with my, my parents and my brother growing up, attended well in school, A-levels for me, typical engineering uh, background with maths, physics, design, technology, um, did enjoy it very much, quite attention, a lot of attention to detail, uh, a couple of awards in my younger years with uh, Audi Design of the Year, finalist, Arkwright Scholar, attended Bristol University, which I enjoyed very much. Um, fond memories there as a mechanical engineer. Um, some of the professors are still there now, doing very well. Um, uh, Wilcox um, enjoyed doing lots of uh, non-destructive testing for the aerospace industry on plane wings and things like that, the electric crystals. Uh, chartered in 2012 and a little bit of my ongoing CBD was around a, a mini MBA to try and understand some of the, what we're talking about with the economics behind these mega projects. Uh, early career wise for me was large EPC contracting companies um, just outside of London, Fleur, Daniel and Kellogg Brown Root. Uh, backgrounds rotating machinery um, and, and packaged equipment, so lots of pumps, turbines, compressors, supporting projects out of uh, Portugal, um, big refinery upgrades, uh, Houston, Oklahoma with um, mechanical seals and pressured equipment, and then Worked out of uh, South Korea um, with Heimberg Heavy Industries, where we did a large LNG uh, modular construction, which ended up um, Gorgon was uh, off the west coast of Australia, well, it's continental shelf there. Moved on to uh, the likes of Shell and Exxon, um, working out of Norway. Uh, the other end of the Langerled pipeline, which is the one that connects the UK and Norway, we did a large upgrade up there to continue the supply of gas. Uh, to around that 20%, which supports the UK um, gas intake. Uh, and we had construction yards in Poland and then building line offices in, in sunny Aberdeen. Uh, from that point, um, and why I'm in the Midlands, uh, I live locally in Leamington Spa, is uh, worked with National Grid to support a large project that they were running, which was a carbon capture storage project as a competition to try and win a CapEx fund. Um, in the Humber region with a white rose carbon capture storage. I was the lead mechanical engineer supporting all of the lead design work and uh, the EPC contract manager prior to sadly it not going 
um, into the construction phase, which was a huge shame. But supporting them with all of their offshore work uh, transitioned it into all of their interconnection, which was their growing business at the time, and uh, supporting all of the national grid interconnector projects uh, since 2015. And since then became independent uh, as an independent consultant, um, supporting a number of uh, transmission system operators as well as developers uh, with um, projects from early feasibility right the way through to, to construction and commissioning. A couple of the ones that are ongoing at the moment is Danish North Sea Energy Island uh, and Bornholm in the Baltic Energy Islands, where those are going to be connected to um, other states to do electricity transmission sharing, as well as uh, Sun Cable, which is um, Australia to Singapore, which is one of the most ambitious projects I think I've ever seen, uh, 4,200 kilometers um, to support then transmission of solar power to Singapore. Uh, Viking Link is the cable sample that I've just been showing around, so apologies to those online. Uh, you can't see the sample, but I'll bring up a photo shortly, uh, which is in its final stages of construction. And uh, NeuConnect, which is a UK German interconnect as well, is starting construction now. Uh, outside of work, um, I support as a non exec to uh, a large charity in, in the West Midlands, as well as an independent school. Uh, I'm on the IMQ Warwickshire. Uh, area as the education secretary, um, so we do events with schools, uh, as well as also then Robot Day, which if you're not aware of Robot Day is a, a relatively small committee but has a great impact. Um, we do Robot Day Coventry, which is now uh, post COVID again, an annual event um, at uh, Coventry College, and that will be happening again in around March of 2024, um, where it's open to all sorts of robotics, automation, and engineering. And, um, but at all ages. And lastly, but certainly not least, a uh, husband and father to three daughters uh, who have enjoyed various uh, offshore wind days. Um, and a little shout out to Offshore Wind for Kids, which is a fantastic small company uh, based out of Belgium. Two brothers have set this up where they have um, started generating their own model wind turbine kits as well as the substructures for children to come along um, on the beach and have have a go at building their own turbines. Back to the heart of it. Um, so majority of countries operate a transmission and distribution network. Um, those are typically their own, either state or um, state controlled or regulated. And those uh, and that demand um, supports both business and domestic um, consumers and we're creatures of habit so that demand curve is within reason relatively predictable and whether we're in the UK or in Norway, France, Sweden that typical trend um, follows a similar pattern across those things. so the demand in terms of time is not the same if you look at it from a large enough macro perspective and that's where interconnectors come in. Um, just a little bit around uh, where the generation, um, the sources of that power are at the moment within the UK. And these are all sources um, that are updated um, live almost. So for example, this is uh, the energy dashboard. And this was this was yesterday. So you get you can have a 24 hour time frame without any problem at all, and you can understand then. Uh, how much solar was produced at various times or interconnection and that colour on here is highlighted in that sort of pinky mauve colour uh, as imports and that is then what we're bringing in internationally along the current currently operating interconnectors. So we, have the colours we, can't see this. Um, we have a mixture so light blue at the top is uh, gas and then working down the screen is solar uh, Coal, hydro, wind is the largest um, producer uh, there in the green um, yesterday, so it was nice and windy. So 12 gigawatts um, in total, which is which is very impressive. You may well have seen some of the tweets and the news uh, where we are, as a nation, slowly um, doing more hours per day or total days of renewable energy production. Uh, and I think there's record breaking with the number of 
wind farms that are going to be coming online in the near future. Coal, um, I don't think was producing. It's point point one gigawatts. Yes, it's hundred megawatts. Which, um, not going to be on on this one. No, it'll be exactly. Yes, yeah, tucked tucked away there. Um, if this was Germany, that would be a very different picture at the moment. Yeah. So, and that's where um, we can call some of the imports low carbon, but whether they're renewable imports or not is is definitely open to open to question scrutiny. Uh, it's the base load. So the grey at the bottom is is the nuclear. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just talking about the split then more graphically, but um, particularly then on the right hand side here, looking at the uh, split between fossil fuels, renewables and low low carbon um, and nuclear classified as you wrote today as a low carbon um, on the right. But that was almost a full day. I got to 11.30, I was like, that's close enough. <laughs> so that was yesterday. Um, one thing just to bring to our attention is the, I'm going to click the next slide actually, which is this one, is the interconnection. So that value that we saw um, of, sorry, what was it? 2.1 gigawatts yesterday is split between a number of these interconnectors. And those are the interconnectors um, between France, the Netherlands, um, Northern Ireland, Ireland, Belgium, uh, and and Norway, and those are the ones we have operation interconnected in, um, with with more on the way, uh, three with France, and uh, one with Netherlands and one with Norway, in the north and south with, with Ireland. Yeah. And the lines going that way, the way we're importing. The lines going that way, the way we're exporting. That's that's absolutely correct. Now I was going to. There's one of the slides that then talks about then the direction of travel. Yes. So all of the interconnectors are designed to be bi bi-directional for exactly that purpose. If the sun is shining or there's a football match on and they need more power because everyone's watching the footy, then then it can be um, purchased and sold in around half an hour slots um, uh, within the transmission system. Uh, not to say there's any gamesmanship between TSOs. I'm sure that never happens around who's going to pay what prices for what and when. Um, but it's also collegiate in that uh, there has been incidents uh, not that long ago where um, the Belgians got us out of a bit of a, a hole where there was uh, a demand that we weren't going to meet. And they then actually fired up one of their own stations in support of us. Um, when we couldn't do that ourselves in, in time. So although that did come at a cost, it was probably worth paying for, for that couple of hours, absolutely. So those interconnectors themselves, we've got a number here. So those are the ones um, in various colours that are uh, built and operational. So going to the Netherlands, Belgium, France, uh, there's one colour that's incorrect here, which is the one to Norway um, uh, on the North North Sea link there, which is also operational. And then we've got the uh, two across to Ireland. One does run from uh, Scotland down to Wales. Um, that's Western Link, uh, but that's actually owned by National Grid um, transmission and not the sort of more venture capitalist style part of National Grid, which is independent, which is National Grid Ventures, who are the um, owner operators of um, the ones that they build. It's a free market in the UK, so anyone who wishes to develop an interconnector is permitted to do so. They can go to the regulator, they can generate them the business model that they can negotiate or whatever, and uh, go ahead and then try and arrange then their own interconnector with various other uh, uh, system operators around around Europe. So the likes of um, Fablink, uh, Neuconnect, uh, 
grid link um, are are independent of national grid, but um, operate in the in the same way. And uh, the system operator uh, in Warwick are obviously then obligated to treat everyone in the same in the same fashion. Uh, this is exactly what you were mentioning around whether you're left or right of the zero mark for import versus export, and um, that changes obviously on a, on a regular basis depending on who's got surplus um, power, what prices are being willing uh, to be negotiated and agreed. And uh, again, open source information and all of these. Um, this is Gridwatch, for example. Uh, highlighting then in the various colors appreciate this isn't that clear it's more clear when you can have a look later but the various integrity actors are then um also cycling so this is uh, a year and you can see a trend around when we are acquiring versus exporting more power in general um, throughout the year as well Uh, touching on offshore wind farms, so the number of offshore wind farms uh, in and around the UK as well as the rest of the North Sea is exploding currently. Um, everyone is obviously trying to meet their political objectives that everyone has, has committed to. The volume of um, cable production, monopiles, nacelles, blades, installation vessels in terms of the supply chain is, is being really pushed. Um, you see a lot of uh, potential uh, infighting around um, the project timeframes, um, contractual obligations that everyone signed up to as part of all of the offshore wind leasing. So the competition in which then you are granted a lease to operate your own wind farm in a particular area. And the prices that you've agreed uh, to to provide power in time frames as well so the more delayed you are the less you're going to make so everyone is, is very much trying to, to chase that but the the reason for showing this is obviously all of all of these wind farms that are then um, proposed and planned um, they're all at various various stages um, in scotland they're a little behind where england has been um, in the you know, production capacity but they are catching very quickly and the same in Ireland as well. And that's only going to help um, the total uh, production capacity of, of the North Sea for everyone's benefit. Is there a reason why there's a gap? Um, there's a gap. Uh, you're right, there is a gap. It's... Dogger. No, no yeah, Dogger Bank um, is these uh, this orange set orange set here so that's um where in terms of bathymetry it's most cost effective where you're then not having to go from um, static turbines into floating so there's a bit of a uh, technological shift from static into floating and that is coming um but at the moment it's in terms of uh offshore leasing in the U in england the um the control of where those wind farms are going to be leased is within um, uh, is within the Crown Estate. So, in order for a wind farm to then be consented and, and built, um, the Crown Estate offer wind leases for particular areas where they believe that the next phase of projects should happen to support them the connection agreements to the grid as well as the cost effectiveness of where those should be. Um, and then the first couple of rounds were then closer to shore to reduce the capex and they're slowly becoming further and further offshore. And those dogger bank ones being the furthest now um, into the North Sea and almost bordering uh, the Dutch sector um, are actually one of those is going to be a DC system because of the route length back to back shore. Sure, that gap will be filled at some point in the next couple of rounds. Is there any, any mention about colours? 
yeah it's just it's purely around um the maturity of the project so yeah so pink is uh um, either planned or permitted uh orange is approved and uh green is um in operation so uh, the largest ones in the in england at the moment are hornsey so these ones just here and that's hornsey one and two you may have heard about those in the union they're operated by uh also which is a danish danish company which used to be called john danish boy and um but they have transitioned and they no longer own those assets so they are purely wind farm and operators now that's um so for example in the danish sector on the east side there all of those gray ones are where the authorities have marine spatial plans um in sort of long-term forecasting on areas where they then are going to commit on a certain number of uh, gigawatts of production um, but the areas aren't fully approved and they haven't been licensed yet they're very early days but that area off the west coast of denmark the large gray sort of uh, triangular spaceship shard looking thing uh, they're looking to have 12 gigawatts of offshore wind production um, there and that's part of the danish uh, energy island you may well have seen in the news where they do plan on having a artificial island and or a combination with platforms to um, support those offshore wind farms not individually having to come up with that capex fund to bring everything back to shore so they'll operate as a, a hub um, in the danish sector and some of that will likely come south towards belgium and the netherlands as well as potentially north to, to norway uh, nothing's been agreed yet with the uk around connection to that energy island but we'll have to see um, some some people are terming that as multi-purpose or multi-point interconnection um, which is also a phrase being used at the moment the days are stuck with energy island and, and dc systems yeah that's right that's their best guess at the moment around um i think they're two gigawatt blocks which is that's what will end up being leased um and they'll probably limit the number of blocks you could have as a single op owner operator so that you're not dominating the market um in terms of supply chain and or manipulating the thing or um you know the company might fail and, and suddenly all that political capital is lost as well. So with all these wind farms, and currently they only have, typically have connection agreements to their own state, the only way to uh, utilize those, that, that power generation in its fullest is to have the interconnection between all of our uh, Northern European colleagues. And here is then, what that looks like with the interconnection um, planned to Norway so there's one operational at the moment that's North Sea Link then there's a future one planned um, North Connect we then have Viking Link which is running from um, Lincolnshire all the way across to Denmark uh, including the onshore we're around 750 kilometers uh, total length. Then there's a number of uh, shorter connections, obviously across to Ireland and then to uh, Northern European colleagues, Belgium, Netherlands, France. Um, and one smart one, which is a LEC link, which actually goes through the Eurotunnel. So they didn't have to do anything apart from pull it, pull it through there. Clever, clever idea that one. I like that one a lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A couple of racks and they're good to go. Uh, no, obviously it was more involved, but um, in terms of capex, that they did, they did well. Just to highlight, then the reasons again behind it is um, little satellite imagery around the 
population centers, the energy density required in certain areas, and, and how we can facilitate that transmission and production. Just thought it was a nice image to, to share around where some of those are. But what is an interconnector and, and how are we making them work? So number one on, on this you know, infographic is the existing transmission system within each of the states. So uh, on this one, this is an example of Viking between the UK and, and Denmark. And those uh, existing assets also include uh, number two, which is the existing substations. And those are then all in the high voltage network and then 400 kV uh, in the UK. And in order for us to connect to Denmark um, with this length, we're trend, um, converting that from an AC to a DC, and that then required a converter station uh, with AC connections between this, uh, the substation and the converter station. Those are typically then underground cables that are, are, are tracked between the two, and those have to be relatively close to one another in order not to, for the losses to start um, cannibalizing the whole concept of, 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 of the system. Uh, typically around five kilometers from the substation to the converter station, that sort of radius. Uh, and then the substations need uh, various upgrades as well. It's part of that, and that's the obligation of the transmission system owner, which is grid or energy network. And then we have the, uh, the converter stations themselves, um, which for this, including the valve and everything else, we're doing it internally rather than the yard. Buildings themselves can be upwards of 20 meters tall, um, which is you know, fairly substantial. So a lot of work goes into making those as uh, acceptable as possible for the for the local population, um, design-wise, and, and mitigations around the site and site selection and everything else as well. Lots of that goes into the work, I'm sure. Uh, the High voltage DC cables themselves um, between the converter stations. So then, what goes across the land under the sea and back up to the other converter station? That uh, is various system designs. And Viking Link, for example, is a, is a dual monopole system. So, what two cables of the same design, but one being positive and one being negative, and uh, in this setup have been. Uh, bundled together and installed all the way across to Denmark. And again, it's bi-directional, so we will be able to receive from them and they can receive power from us. So they travel side by side? They are independent cables and they are stranded together, uh, bundling, um, so they're strapped uh, when they go off the back of the vessel. One of the fun things about interconnectors is that they're multi-jurisdictional. And quite often that means that someone has to approve and support a project, even though they don't get any direct benefit themselves, which is always a fun political game when we're then having an environmental impact for whatever project that is in a jurisdiction that gets no direct benefit. So in this case, uh, the interconnection is from the UK to Denmark, and we're crossing a big portion of the Dutch sector and also the German bite. And in order to uh, try and mitigate any concerns um, as well as political pressures, there's a couple of directives to allow the permitting of that to not be hindered too much. And those are. Uh, projects where you can apply for a status being projects of common interest to support this notion that we're all moving in the right direction and once you get a project of common interest and you're within the 10-year network development plan which is a, a long look ahead to try and support this your um, the status of the project um, within those permitting regimes is well recognized and although you have to abide by or the local legislation as well, um, there shouldn't be any uh, nimbyism 
on on the on a TSO and a state level regarding these projects. But again, to highlight the level of interconnection around Europe, so it's not just the North Sea, it is Europe and the rest of the world um, looking to uh, support the energy transition. Okay, so that was a brief run through interconnection, offshore wind farms, why we're going in this direction generally. And where do mechanical engineers, marine engineers come come into all of this? And a lot of it is around the cable itself. They are wonderful products, they're exceptionally well designed by very smart electrical engineers, but they are not robust. They are not large pipelines with huge wall thicknesses and concrete coatings that you can just throw down into the sea and it's all going to be okay. Um, they've got very delicate components in them, including fiber optics. So there are sometimes then integrated fiber optics um, or the uh, pair of cables, for example, on Viking Link has then an ind independent fiber optic cable that's then the third cable in this little bundle package. And that is what's going off the back of the vessel to then allow communications between the converter stations themselves and um, direct understanding, as well as support in any issues around fault finding, should there be an issue with the cable that is then more easily identifiable around the distance from shore that there might be a fault. The weight of the cables themselves is, is genuinely tricky. They are very, very heavy given their size. Um, we're talking uh, around 50 kilos a meter, depending on the cross-sectional area of the cable, the amount of transmission it's got, uh, and also the number of armored layers. Um, the number of armored layers is typically dependent on the water depth that's being, um, the cables are being installed in. Upwards of 500 meters water depth is quite often dual armored um, in order to that suspension mode in cable design. One of the other limitations around the cable design is the bend radius. Um, the copper core is designed to uh, allow a certain amount of movement within it, but that does absolutely have a limit, and that limit is variable depending on the cable design itself. Uh, typically, four to five meters. So if you're if you're arcing your cable or trying to lift it and there's a, 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 a point load on that that's allowing that bend to reduce beyond that, that is um, likely to cause, uh, maybe not immediately, but a potential point of failure in the future. Um, if the lead sheath is damaged, one of the layers, any unbonding, things like that. So it may not be immediately apparent, but it's something that needs to be constantly monitored during installation. Did you say four to five? Four to five. Between four and five. It can be can be lower, but it does depend on the on the cable itself. Compared to pipe. <laughs> Compared to pipe, they are. And that's and that's part of the problem. Uh, that level of um, robust and stiffness isn't uh, integrated within the design. Um, and although that supports uh, transport, so the reels, the cassettes, the carousels are then smaller, it doesn't support the installation so well. Brief overview of the design, a copper core, um, various layers to control then um, for the EMF. Um, there's then bonding tape, lead sheath. Uh, all of these things are then to stop water ingress as well. Um, both uh, axially and longitudinally, there's some which in there too. And then on the uh, second to outer, we have the uh, galvanized steel armor wire, which is the principal difference between um, onshore HVDC and, and offshore HVDC regarding the design itself um, to cost saving, it's an installation, uh, weight saving uh, and space saving as well, not to have that. The installation challenges and where we as engineers then are doing a lot of the a lot of the uh, the grunt work um, around routing. 
So I mentioned around the water depths, around the bathymetry, the changing topography, the changing in soil conditions um, is very important to the routing to allow the installation to be as easy and effective as it possibly can be in order to install and protect the cable below the seabed. The North Sea is uh, fairly forgiving. Um, the water depths aren't significant, even the ones going up towards Norway, um, although we're talking 250, 300 metres, uh, isn't significant, but the change of the bathymetry, the slope angles, everything else is, is significant. So that's something that is uh, surveyed beforehand as part of the uh, routing and the route study work. We'll come on to the burial. No, no, absolutely. We'll come on to the burial methodologies in a minute. And there's two different ways of doing exactly that. There's a lay and burial simultaneously using a plough type method, or there's a lay and then burial with a separate vessel using various trenches to then bury the cable as far as possible uh, beneath the soil, uh, the seabed surface. One of the other challenges is the weather. The North Sea is not particularly forgiving. And whilst trying to um, do these installations themselves, obviously there's um, wave, wind, currents uh, going on all at the same time. And the uh, challenges that poses and the installation windows when it's preferred uh, in order to reduce the potential cost increases due to delays. Uh, the last thing you want is to have cable off the back of the vessel and be bobbing up and down in a storm, wondering if it's going to hold and or bring down the boat if it's significant enough. Um, although there's heat compensation and everything else, and the cable can take a fairly large amount of cyclical loading, it's um, not, something, not something you want. So you look for those weather windows um, and uh, vessels that are have the largest capability as well. If looking at these graphs, for example, and on the key on the right hand side there, between zero and five for um, significant wave height HS. Operationally for installation, talking maximum of around two to 2.5 meters during install. So you can see that there are parts of the North Sea where um, that that does become a challenge uh, all year round for certain. Uh, the summer seasons are, are then better for that. Back to your point on protection. Um, if we were to lay the cable just on the seabed and leave it as it was, uh, that would almost inevitably at some point during the operational life mean that it gets uh, knocked about by something. And whether that is anthropogenic risk, principally being uh, anchor drags. Um, so vessels who are dragging on anchor or unaware that they're dragging their own anchor um, with an anchor that's um, skipping along the seabed will likely then come along and, and strike the cable and damage it. We you know, talked about they're not concrete coated pipes. They are um, cables with, with relatively thin uh, layers, which upon damage will cause a failure, if not immediately, but um, in, the, in the near future with water investment and uh, everything else. The other anthropogenic risk, particularly in the North Sea, uh, historically is our fishing fleet, where we have um, trawl boards going along the seabed to um, pick up everything that they're, they're after. There's a few different types um, off the board are one of the worst ones for penetration beneath the seabed. And that is exactly what we're then looking to protect the cables uh, against. That protection itself depends very much on um, the amount of seabed mobility in the area. So if there are large sand waves moving around, we have to understand that so that we can look at the, whether they're cyclical, whether they are um, just moving uh, uh, from one area to another and the height of those sand waves to develop a base reference level where we believe that that 
impacts, um, that layer of sediment won't be moving and to then bury beneath that to a certain extent so that across the operational life of 40 plus years, hopefully that cable will remain buried uh, forever uh, until it needs to be removed, recovered uh, as part of the decommissioning, which is also features as part of some of the permit agreements now, unlike historically some of the oil and gas assets, which are um, not obligated to do that currently. The way that that's measured uh, is called a depth of burial, and that depth of burial is then the amount of sediment that's left on top of the cable after it's been installed beneath the seabed. That is different to the depth of lowering, where you can lower a cable into a trench, but if there's nothing on top of it, it's not that protected in case an anchor does come along and, and skip into that trench or a trawl board comes along and, and does connect with the cable. So a lot of the installation requirements for contractors is around depth of burial to, to support that. Just a little image here then of um, exactly that scenario where a uh, cable system was jetted uh, into the seabed with a depth of lowering, DL of 1.5 metres, but because of that particular soil type, those conditions and the methodology used with the jetter, uh, the depth of burial, so the sediment on top, was only 30 centimetres. And sadly, an anchor did come along and strike the cable um, before enough natural backfill and, and a movement of the seabed could support then a greater depth of burial to stop that penetration from the anchor. Um, so, uh, you know, a lesson learned on that one from uh, another project and um, the installation methodology and the level of backfill prior to handover of the asset is, is really critical. There are, very much so. So one of the other projects uh, the National Grid have also been involved with is North Sea Link, which is, which is now operational, that's up to Norway. And the uh, conditions up there, particularly the Norwegian end, are much more granite based. And there are um, methods to choose between. You can choose to cut through that rock itself with a relatively narrow cut in order to lay the cables directly in. You're pre-cutting that rock. And then protection, whether that's sand or rock back on top. In, in terms of smaller, um, smaller grading, um, or you can opt to lay the cable directly on and simply protect it with um, a full pipe vessel rock that comes in and then does long lengths of rock protection on top of the cable system. Um, it's very much dependent on how long a stretch you've got that you would have to either do with mechanical cutting. It's a very slow process in terms of meters per hour of, of successful trenching versus the cost of the rock, uh, location to a good quarry, and also whether the environmental implications for that particular area are too extreme for the local authorities to accept. Um, there's a, a reticence to have rock being installed for, for long sections. A cable repair. Um, yeah. Well, the, the repair is effectively cutting out the damaged section and, and then replacing that and then dropping the cable back in again, reburying it. So, moving on from the protection requirements into then some uh, equipment, particularly then looking at the vessels initially. And we talked about briefly the uh, the weather and where the vessels are going to come to do the cable uh, lay. Those vessels have to compensate for heave, uh, ocean currents, which are linear or non-linear, depending on the water depth and the location. Monitoring then at the, the touchdown monitoring at the seabed, the, the bottom tension of the cable, the bend radius, making sure that that's not being exceeded as well. Uh, the direction of travel to make sure the vessel's not moving backwards and, and um, 
exactly that, having a having a big S in there, um, as well as monitoring the top angle, uh, the offshoot angle, so that the the cable is um, being positioned correctly. The vessels are are very advanced um, now. There's a a new latest and greatest, which is from a company called Prismian, one of the leaders, global global leaders for cable uh, manufacture and installation. This is the Leonardo da Vinci, um, where they have dynamic positioning on a lot of the larger vessels now, and that can support cable touchdown uh, accuracy within plus or minus two meters to the majority of water depths. Um, certainly we're looking at the moment. Uh, which is impressive and uh, <coughs> how much to hire per day <laughs> um if you'd asked me that a couple of years ago uh it would be around 125,000 euros a day uh now it's it's going north that um it depends uh what risk you're willing to take um, if it's a lump sum contract versus a reimbursable, if they're down on whether are you paying it or are they paying it, um, the length and duration of the project, and we'll talk about who's taking what risk. Uh, but we, yes, it's north, well north of 125,000. Obviously, that's not purely profit. There's a lot of people to look after on a vessel like this. The, the, the persons on board, um, about 80. Uh, then do a full installation. You've got the cable jointers as well as the crew, as well as all the chefs and everything else as well on board. Yes, the you know, uh, How this actually then goes ahead and gets uh, is taking place, there's a number of storage units on these cable A vessels, and those are obviously five engineers supporting then the installation themselves. They are there's a difference between um, some of the vessels. Some have static tanks or baskets, and you can see here they have typically an inner core and an outer core, uh, outer ring, and that supports then the uh, minimum bending radius, so the cable can never then, within that uh, container, basket or carousel, be exceeded. And uh, there's just another photo there. I'll skip to one. This one here is the, the back side um, of a, uh, that's the Leonardo da Vinci, which actually has two of these large carousels, uh, both on deck and between those two, uh, total uh, weight of cable that can be transported and installed is around 14,000 tons um, of, of cable there. And there's always a balance to strike or to understand between the carousel volume capacity versus its load capacity and some um, larger three core uh, alternating current AC cables that are then more restricted on volume rather than weight because they have so much more uh, load density in terms of per meter than the DC cables. They run out of space rather than weight, depending on the cable design. So for uh, the Leonardo da Vinci with a DC system that has to have two carousels and a cable for each bundled together off the back of the deck, uh, about 100 kilometers of route length, so 200 kilometers of cable. So, for example, uh, the Viking link cable between the UK and Denmark uh, is taking seven campaigns, seven, seven trips to, to do that installation. Uh, in, well, there's, yes, including the onshore, <laughs> there's, there's uh, some more, but yes, yes. Yeah, correct. So you, you place it down on the seabed and uh, mark where it is, um, protect it if you believe it's necessary, or have a guard vessel on site to ward off everyone else, ring the bell, get on the radio, 
flares, whatever's needed to stop someone uh, going over the top of that, that end. And they would normally leave uh, twice the water depth in terms of cable length to then retrieve, bring on board, joint to the next piece that's already in the carousel, and then start laying again. I've got a picture of the joint to show you in a second. No, no, you, you do a grapnel run. Um, sometimes the, uh, there's a marker buoy as well with a, like a Chinese finger netted on the end. Um, it depends how quickly you plan on returning. If it's going to be there a while, you may prefer not to have something on the surface that get entangled. Uh, so it depends on the project. No, uh, all the repairs, and I'm going to caveat that in a second, but all repairs take place on vessels. Yeah, so the cable's brought to surface. Correct, yeah, and that's dependent on the water depth. Obviously, the more shallow, the less you have to retrieve. But absolutely. In terms of controlling that cable on the vessel, all sorts of mechanical equipment, and that uh, is typically in the range of these linear cable engines or tensioners, and those are uh, either tracked um, or wheeled, so they can be tracked like a, a tank tank tracks or or wheeled um, uh, something that's actually not as uh, high tech as it looks, but they are. Um, with Dunlop around controlling the friction factors and the wear. Um, they can control then the compression strength, uh, compression against that cable as well to make sure it's not exceeded. And they can all be adjusted depending on which cable they happen to be handling at that time. The second style is the large wheel in the center here, the green one, which is a, a drum cable engine or a capstan where the cable is uh, wrapped around, which is then controlling the, uh, the payout. Uh, in a controlled way at the back of the vessel. And all need uh, support and uh, mechanics on board to make sure they're all running smoothly, being monitored continuously uh, throughout throughout all of the work. Did they have an auxiliary engine? They're all, yes, they've, they've got their own power jet. No, they've got um, or, or, or auxiliary, particularly <coughs> if the cable loses power, you don't want to lose power to the tensioners because unless you're going to fail close everything. You need to keep your position in power. And the, yeah, the DP is going to always be independent. Um, the DP class of a vessel then is principally around the levels of redundancy but for that, that reason. Cable lay. Uh, around then um, other equipment on board these large vessels, so winches, um, pathways, the chutes at the back of the vessels themselves, uh, all the sensors and equipment, and also on the right hand side there, an example of one of the quadrants, which is then used to control um, the cable being lowered to the seabed without uh, exceeding that minimum bend radius. A tricky task because you obviously have to get that to the seabed, unhook the cable remotely um, using class and also ROV monitoring, remote off of vehicle monitoring to then make sure that when you start lifting that quadrant again, nothing is caught because you almost guarantee then to, to exceed that minimum bending radius if part of it is only caught on that quadrant prior to its retrieval. You're asking about jointing. One of the joints that's uh, an inline joint. So this is where a cable end has been retrieved from the seabed, jointed inside this jointing container on the back deck, which is then uh, uh, controlled conditions, not an attic seal or anything like that, but controlled conditions and um, jointed with some um, cable protection systems on, on the ends to make sure that the, the cable is not going to be uh, overbent and uh, then lowered with a spreader beam um, in line, put on the chute inside the cable trains, engine, cable engines, and 
then the vessel can carry on laying the rest of the cable. When a quadrant is being used, it's then going to form an omega loop where you've, your vessel has laid out its cable, is coming to the end of the last section, both ends are brought aboard to then be jointed together. And this is then typically where the final joint for a cable system is, is then installed. And that's called an omega loop principally because of the shape it makes between being laid uh, whilst then on the seabed and then protected. On to methods, tools, seabed preparation. We talked sand waves, uh, we talked about the slopes, angles. Um, there are fabulous vessels called trailer such and hopper dredges where they are the vacuum vacuum cleaners of seabed with large uh, trail arms which will then fluidize the seabed um, in strips to suck it up uh, and then put it inside using suction pumps put it inside the hoppers and can either be uh, 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 opened or dropped um, into a specific site that's been pre-approved as part of a permitting activity where it's where it's allowed um, or it can be used um, in some types of beach replenishment, beach nourishment works, where then it can be sprayed back to shore. There's lots of those types of activities, even in, on the East Coast in Lincolnshire, for example, there's an annual uh, beach replenishment activity that a, a Dutch company does for Dr. Bernard. Next type, we talked about rock earlier. So there's full pipe vessels, and these are vessels that will go to a uh, quayside, uh, a quarry uh, for the North Sea, principally Norway, where you get very good rock, very large quarries, and they will get loaded up and bring rock to where it's needed, either for cable protection or for crossings of other assets where there needs to be a separation between a pipeline or another cable and then the cable that's going to be uh, laid across the top. And those are fantastic vessels. They have four pipes which um, have uh, ROVs and they are controlled at the bottom where uh, the position is, is incredibly accurate. The uh, rock grading that goes through those is up to around 600 millimeters, uh, millimeters. So they're quite considerable if you need them to be, but uh, you run the risk of that being stuck, um, of course. So typically the, the grading of those rocks would be somewhere in the region of uh, two to four inches, uh, but a lot of the um, stability calculations were performed based on the symmetry, uh, the water depth, uh, the amount of currents locally to understand whether that rock berm that's going to be created is going to be stable throughout a one in 100 year storm, for example, or whatever design criteria is. Cable burial. So back to your item around protection. Three different ways to classify and identify the tools that are used to do that. What's the method of penetrating the soil? How are we going to guide the cable if we're guiding the cable down to uh, the required or target depth of lowering? And how is that piece of equipment moving forward in the direction of travel along the cable? We have these four principal categories, a cable plough, which uh, can be used in a simultaneous lay and bury or a post lay burial scenario. A mechanical trencher, top right, which um, can be wheel or, or, or a, a tongue type uh, trenching tool, which is physically moving the materials. A mass flow excavation or a jet trencher, the bottom two, where we're using uh, water under various conditions, pressures, to uh, move or fluidize part of the seabed to allow the cable to be to be buried. Won't go into a lot of detail on this one, but you can see them afterwards. And this is produced by one of the authorities, Seagray, around the categorization of those types of equipment, where on the left hand side, we're looking at the soil penetration method, varying from the top from a very mechanical uh, uh, ploughing technique and mechanical technique 
down this down the gradings to jetting and then right at the bottom to the mass flow excavator which is uh, a big water hair dryer moving moving sediment around on the x-axis looking then at the uh, methodology around the guidance of the cables into the seabed and whether those are anything from just having an open trench and the cables are resting in there under their own weight to being fully uh, guided down in a vertical uh, vertical guidance system or using a depressor arm to push the cable uh, into that into that seabed no no you're absolutely right so that's part of that categorization so the plows are bollard pulled um, either with the cable lay vessel or a auxiliary vessel support vessel and they are as if they are a farming plow they are pulled along the seabed and the cable is then routed through those and, and down through into the bottom of the, the bottom of the trench um, the different types of course and i'll come on to that in a second around some of those have uh, a jetting aspect as well to reduce that friction in the front of the plow and, and some don't but some are much more uh, brutal um, in effect yeah it's pulled by a surface correct yeah 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 no, the um, depending the reason why you would go and uh, let me skip to this one. Perhaps this explains slightly. I know you probably can't read that from there, but the top line where the plow is, for example, and where the uh, force balance um, shear plow is as well. The description of the soil category in there is uh, towards the top end, the harder end being uh, clay or glacial till and the reason then for choosing that methodology of installation is because of the soil conditions so the only way to pull something like that at um, a significant barrier depth is, is with a very large amount of tow force so the bollard pulls i mean we're talking around 60 to 100 ton so an rov that's uh either tracked or or, or free free moving free floating is not going to have that that capacity So a lot of um, science and engineering goes into producing tables like this, where um, there are various working groups within the uh, within the in the sphere um, within Seagray, which is um, sort of ASME of the cables world. Uh, typically, is only focused on the electrical components, um, transformers, capacitors, cable design. Everything else, but it's slowly realizing that there is a lot more to do around the installation and protection of these systems long term. And there have been some working groups and um, pleased to support uh, a company called Prima Marine uh, in some of those discussions. And uh, they then produce tables like this around the capabilities and soil types for various tool classifications to allow developers to look at the installation rates, the soil types, what they expect to see and what they expect to achieve um, when they're doing their installations. Tables like that be created by a collection company or is it one overseas body that? Yeah, this is a uh, this has come from a guidance document from Seagray themselves as part of it as deliverable as an output from one of his working groups. So it's in the regular no no there's no um, regulation around the methodology of installation. Um, I think the uh, only requirement from the regulators, regulators' perspective, so Ofgem in the UK's uh, is, UK sphere, is that uh, money needs to be spent appropriately. So if the selection of a tool within a contract yeah. is poor, is in, is effectively incorrect, or the execution of the contract is um, you know, Negligent is probably a bit too strong a word, woeful perhaps. Um, Ofgem do come in and do uh, audits, and uh, but that's only from a national grid regulated point of view, not from a from an independent company point of view who's developing interconnectors. 
they wouldn't be subject to, to that within reason, of course, because they're still going to have a effectively a contract with capital law, for example, then. Uh, but the more money they spend doesn't mean they're going to make more money in that, in that way, unlike National Grid, where it's a CapEx Plus type scenario. These are guidelines. Absolutely, yeah, and um, you know, in these guidelines, and nothing's ever uh, entirely black and white mm -hmm. regarding soil conditions. So your um, your KPA regarding the, the, the stiffness of the soils, your the layering of the soils is never the same. You then have um, the granular size affects the resedimentation and speed. Uh, all of these things make the tool selection quite challenging. And of course, a particular tool for one section won't be the right tool for the next section. Yeah. And where are you going to take either the risk or are you going to spend the time to keep changing tools? Of course, that's then an additional cost to have something sat on deck not being used because you're typically renting those mm -hmm. from somewhere. Else. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So, in terms of the question was, uh, are we collecting uh, seabed samples to understand the seabed and the soil conditions uh, before the installation? And yes, that is typically done. So before, as part of the route selection, there will be a geophysical survey, a geotechnical survey, and then to support the permitting, a benthic survey um, for ecology. Those geotechnical samples are then uh, viber cores, so core samples themselves, uh, typically down to about three to five meter core sample length to then take back to the laboratory to then do uh, various um, lab tests to then understand the stiffness, the um, shear strengths, the uh, soil um, uh, using the sieve tests to understand the, the size of each of the grains as well, and the, and the laminar layers. That is a fantastic question. So the question was how far apart should those samples be? And uh, the question is how much money does one want to spend um, trying to adopt a risk profile for a project that you're willing to have? Because typically those, uh, those tests, those samples, that survey is done before the project is fully commissioned and going to go into construction. So it's uh, all of that money is, is at risk cost. Companies typically, in order to engage the supply chain and have a risk balance that is seen as traditional, it's somewhere between 1.5 kilometers and 500 meters. Typically, a kilometer, if you're looking to um, de risk your, your own position as a developer, you do it more frequently, you spend that money early. To then provide that information to the contractors so that when there's an issue around speed or successful burial, you can say, Well, did have all of this information, it was all provided as best as possible, uh, whether it was rely upon or for information. It's, uh, some of the lawyers love to get involved with, but yes, around a kilometer. You get situations where you try. Um, so the question was, do we often see different soil sample, different soil characteristics between samples? Uh, the answer is that will be seen. Part of the geophysical survey uh, is um, often a sub bottom profiler. So that uh, pinger or chirper will provide then a laminar view of the seabed. So your geotechnical sampling is used to verify what those layers are, which you are then looking to interpret and track between your sample stations. If you can see something popping up and you're not quite sure then beyond that which layer is which, is why you choose the sample locations that you do. So you try and do the geophysical first and interpretation as best as possible to support selective 
smart geotechnical station sampling. Super. Uh, burial tools. I will fire through some of these. And again, that they're running from um, the uh, lower end of the uh, intrusiveness and we'll move move up that y axis up towards the larger plow type tools. So this is a jet trencher using high pressured water at the front of those uh, jetting arms, swords. Uh, this one has a, a single pair of sword location um, arms either side of the cable, and there's no uh, handling of the cable system to push that cable down into the into the trench that's uh, fluidized. And a quick note: I'd like to thank Prima Marine for allowing me to to share these. This is a similar tool, uh, the UT1. Um, CTC, where again it's a single pair of uh, swords in one location, high pressure water at the front, and in this one you can see at the back what looks like a small stinger arm. That is the depressor where the cable is then pushed down into into the trench when it's being fluidized. Another way to effectively um, give the cable time to uh, lower into the system is using an eductor. So to pull sediment out the back um, after it's been fluidized so that it doesn't resettle as quickly and that allows the cable to uh, lower under its own weight. And this is the T750 from Canyon. Who, uh, do a lot of uh, installation equipment. The big, bigger cousin is the T1500 and this then provides a again a single pair of swords but with a backwash so instead of deducting liquidized uh, fluidized uh, seabed um, away from the trench this pushes it further back through the trench that has already been fluidized such that the cable can be uh, have time to lower itself as well as offering the opportunity for that backwash to provide depth of cover, depth of burial cable that was um, installed a few, few seconds previously. What would be the typical name? Yeah, so that's a great question. If it's a traditional cable lay on its own and then a trencher is going to come afterwards, um, depending on the weather conditions, but if everything's going smoothly, 400 to 500 meters an hour for, for the cable lay. For the trenching, um, again, that's very much soil dependent. Uh, if it's a jet trencher in nice conditions, 250 to 300. So you do one then the other. That's what I'm you don't need, they're not one for they will follow each other as closely as possible, but of course the cable lay is happening traditionally faster. So the, the time frame between a cable lay followed by the cable trenching support vessel, there will be uh, requested to be guard vessels to monitor the activity above that cable until the trenching can come along and do its protection. In terms of the protection of the system, you're absolutely right. Yeah, so you can only go the speed of the slowest of the two. Another very capable uh, tool is the cat jet. This is from Nexons, who are based out of uh, Norway, although they're Danish owned. Um, and this has uh, multiple swords, has a front and then two uh, in, in cable system uh, swords. Uh, but then again, no, no depressor. So it allows the length of the fluidized seabed to be longer because it's got a front and a back sword such that that fluidized seabed remains in a state of flux and allows that cable to lower itself uh, as effectively as possible. Then we move on to the uh, 
bladed or stinger type installation tools. This is the Hydroplow from Prismin. Um, there's a similar one from NKT called the OJ2200. And this is where a, um, the front blade of a Hydroplow is uh, fluidized water to cut through the front edge to reduce the friction. And then what we we're talking about before to reduce the total bollard pull requirements by having that, that front edge um, fluidizing the seabed in front of it. And again, then the guidance is a, is a slope through a chute to then push the cable to the bottom of that, that trench. So as long as the uh, skids are on the floor, seabed, the cable lowering and burial is, is very effective. For them. Does it do so well with boulders? No. So again, it's a selection choice around the seabed, around their understanding of geophysics, geotechnics of the area. No, this is a this is a fully skidded um, one against the bollard pool. It's very much ski style. Uh, it's the other tools that have traps or, or wheels, um, and then they're under their own under their own scheme. And then one of the largest ones for uh, very deep burial is a, a vertical uh, vertical injector. And this um, can, is typically then um, vessel mounted. And we're talking eight, 10, 12 meters of burial, particularly used in Northern North Sea, uh, sorry, the Northern European North Sea, um, where there are lots of large mud flats, where anchor penetrations are extremely high because the, um, the soils are incredibly soft. So that burial of eight meters or so through shipping channels, particularly, is, is really required to make sure those cables remain protected. Um, through softer sediments, um, and in the same way, anchors bury themselves, plows bury themselves. So there's a style of forced balance um, plow that can be used uh, in, in softer, but um, regions where there's often clay so this will where that clay is very hard to jet through or peat um, but if you have a plow in there that was a pure plow it would end up burying itself so a, a fourth balance plow to give it some lift at the same time as burying um, but then requires large bollard so it's a good it's a good balance for the right vessel uh, a couple of others um, also a vibrating blade to reduce that friction Instead of a hydro uh, jet to reduce the friction, so it's a vibrating, vibrating blade at the front. On to uh, mechanical trenches. So we're using um, wheel cutters, we're using um, uh, 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 wide chainsaws, effectively, is what they are, to then cut through rock or, or very hard sediments. Um, and again, these ones typically don't have uh, depressors, but are very good at allowing that trench to be opened up in hard conditions. This is the eye trencher from Canyon and also has an adapter on the side to suck out any remaining fluidization in the back. One of my favorites is it looks like a monster and it is a monster. Um, is a item from Trav Ocean, which is a wheel cutter, and uh, something like that, if not that one, was used on North Stephen, cutting rather long sections of granite um, for the cable to be lowered into. This is then a similar one, but a pre-construction activity. So this is the scar plow, where it opens up a trench itself to then remain open for the cable to be laid in afterwards. So this is the, the other way around and allowing that trench to remain open um, for the cable to be lowered and then whatever method of cover afterwards. Um, this particular one, the scar plow, there's also other ones that can be inverted, which are then inverted and pulled back across after the cable has been laid to bring the material back into the trench. Comes with its own risks depending on the 
sediment type. You know, again, if there's larger rocks or boulders in that, really those backing on top of the cable isn't isn't the, the best thing in the world. Uh, it's rather more uncontrolled than a full pipe vessel. So it's uh, it's a choice at the end of the day. But there's some some of those things. Yeah, so the question was, can those um, activities be monitored? And they almost always are. So uh, there are remote operated vehicles, um, on umbilicals being controlled from the surface to monitor the cable lay, so the touchdown monitoring, to monitor then the installation tools themselves. They also have then cameras on that they're all mounted and with the umbilicals coming back to surface, it's constantly monitored. Uh, all of the sensors now have their own telemetry as well, and that can also be beamed back to shore to understand um, if the bollard pull is too high, if it's got stuck, if the, um, uh, the speed is being reduced for some reason, even though the track speed is showing the same, so you can see if it's slipping. There's a whole lot of criteria, and you can set alerts against various criteria as well to highlight if there's, if there's an issue. Uh, not too much more, but a couple of things then on what happens uh, if or how it can go wrong um, in two phases. One is during the installation itself, and I've intentionally neglected uh, the electrical side of this in terms of, yes, the cable can be manufactured incorrectly, from our perspective, that's not something that we're worried about. If it fails the high voltage test at the end, whilst everything is mechanically being done correctly, it's not what we can do uh, from from our from our side of the of the, of the bargain. But during the installation, um, and one of the things then reflecting again on the soil schematization, the location of any. Um, changes in the seabed and the laminar layers. Some tools are more susceptible to toppling. Um, if you haven't prepared the seabed correctly, you can typically do a slope of around 10 degrees with the majority of these trenches. Anything more than that, and you're running the risk of it being either not capable of going up or down that slope or, or of toppling, and that's both um, uh, uh, laterally and Actually, so the yaw and the pitch are both really important on on this. So the routing through the perimeter of the seabed is is incredibly important. So we have had instances where um, tools are toppling over and potentially damaging cables, and you then have to make a choice of: do you want to go and make a joint repair, or are you going to run the risk that it was actually okay and a couple of years later during your warranty period as a contractor you then have to come back at multiples of the cost it would have been if you would just committed to doing it then and there and that's a big big decision typically taken in discussion and consideration with the asset owner or the company developer themselves uh, depressors although they really support that opportunity for the cable to be pushed down to the seabed as much as possible come with their own risks Lots of the jetting activities end up bringing stones, can end up bringing stones into that channel, um, especially if they're enclosed and getting caught. Um, so the guidance um, is very much um, a, a, a choice around then what you see within the seabed conditions and whether you want to run the risk of using presses or not. So. The implications of any of those things happening, you can see on here, is then um, some rather unhappy looking cable. Uh, implications being then a cable repair, additional jointing, bringing into effect then potential future failure locations, schedule delays. And the reason why I mentioned that is because it's not simply a joint for a week. Where you're doing post lay burial, you typically won't have the jointing team on board. If you don't need them, you're just laying a cable. Uh, if you're just burying a cable and it's already been laid, why have a team of 14 to 18 
persons on board that you're not going to use. So then you have to get them to site if they're available, helicopters in and out, all of that, all of that fun and games. So not something you want to do. Cost increases, obviously, and then the potential then that that cable won't have been buried correctly either. So you might not meet your permitting requirements, which may cause issues with the authorities uh, such that they could, very unlikely to happen, but they could hold off your allowing to receive your operations, your operating permit, if you haven't met their conditions. During operations, so we talked about anchors and anchor penetration, and it does happen. This was a good example in 2019. It was actually even in a river, so the vessels were reasonably sized, but not what you can see. But an anchor has uh, absolutely trashed one of these cables. Um, there's a little video clip if we want to see it, and maybe I'll just go to the lessons learned first and come back, and we'll see if it works. Uh, <laughs> we'll give it a go. But the implications of that were on this is in Ghana, where there were blackouts. They then had um, onshore asset failure as well because it was a um, unintended failure of, of the system and their um, protection systems of the rest of their infrastructure weren't quite up to up to muster. And that also then led to um, load shedding for months until they could get everything else um, back and running again. So a real, a real issue for them. So the lessons learned out of that as a nutshell, uh, understanding the surroundings and the route selection, understanding the submarine, the soils themselves, and protect the asset correctly uh, using an appropriate tool, whether that's then right for this soil penetration method, cable guidance, if you're willing to take any risks around that, and then how it's going to be moving along the submarine floor itself. Those are all the slides I have. If you're willing to bear with me, we'll see if this little video works. One second, because it's a little bit of fun because it's one of the only times I've seen a system operator owning up to it. Hang on. That's um, there's sadly one of the implications of not uh, managing your route, managing your barrier protection, and everything else uh, correctly, and it impacts other people. Um, those were was I couldn't see online if there was anyone writing any questions, so apologies. So I think we're okay for questions on there. Anything else from from uh, from yourselves in in the room? 
going to sign. Ask me what what the biggest tech, technological change over the last five years. Okay. Yeah, I think the biggest there um there's a number of areas of genuine improvement the uh, installation vessels themselves are getting much bigger um, while still allowing themselves to come as close to shore as possible one of the principal challenges is the larger the vessel the larger the, the deeper the draft it gets further from the coast typically around 10 meters of water depth so suddenly you've got this section where you can't quite get there with the vessel or you can float the cable in. That's two kilometers. Who's going to take the risk for that? Um, the uh, cables market has also certainly improved and had the benefit of the oil and gas world coming before it. Um, there's a lot of the installation vessels that have very good history around large install work. The burial tools themselves have come on an awful lot with the um, improvement around modelling um, and uh, computer programming and the way that the size of the CPUs and all of the systems to support really detailed fluid dynamic modelling. Yes. Yes. Sensing on the equipment, uh, yes, yes, uh, certainly. It's now far less um, prone to human error. Um, all of that is far more closely calibrated. Boundaries of what the cables can take is also more clearly defined than what it used to be, certainly. Long ago, since the first telegraph cables were put across the Atlantic and and the first set failed and, and everything else. So, um, no, we're in a much better place. Not to say it's perfect by any stretch, but it's certainly getting there. Absolutely not. Um, why do you see? Yeah, so I wasn't going to include any of the slides around AC versus DC, but the, the effect, the, effectively the answer is transmission loss. So the, uh, there's a breaking point between what's uh, commercially viable or sensitive from alternating current into DC current and the system length. So broad stroke from the air, anything over 120 kilometers of route length, we should be more leaning towards DC. We can do some um, calculations around losses uh, based on the current rating, the power, the power requirements, excuse me, everything else. But uh, the moment you're tripping over that 100 kilometers, it's a real uh, gray zone between AC and DC. Anything above 150, almost exclusively DC. Um, there are a number of um, steps that uh, the electrical design supports because they go through fairly rigorous testing in order to be qualified. Um, 330, 400, and 525, typically kilovolts for the larger interconnect. Um, that depends on what. You're looking to push down the system. Uh, can't remember what we're operating for Viking. No, no, the amps, the amps are low. Relatively low. Oh, yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, because the volts are high. I can't recall what the amps are. That, that one in Guyana, which is yes. where is it going from? The US across. All the way across the US, across the north of Mexico. Or is it between two, you're talking about between two substations? Um, 
I don't actually I don't actually know specifically. It was from the US News. Yeah, it could just be that reason, absolutely. Yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't couldn't say explicitly, but uh just felt it was a interesting example of, of a real anchor doing some real damage. Okay. Um, going back to your I think you're just playing the first slide. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. With the mm -hmm. energy. Um, one, of, one of these? Yeah, that one. Yeah. So I went on an IMA key tour of our local gas power station when I was and we've shown by that about 15 years ago. Um, there was a lot of coal gas, mm. uh, not a lot of wind or solar. So obviously the way that sort of the sun shines when it wants to shine, wind blows when it wants to blow sort of thing, and you've got your interconnects as well. So in terms of getting the balance right, sort of I'm assuming it's flipped from 15 years ago where you have more control of what you generate compared to getting the balance. So how would you, with the interconnect, obviously that there's a dual direction, but how is it, how is the, is, I'm assuming it's quite intricate to get a balance right for the, these days with the renewables. It is, it is, absolutely. Um, obviously I'm not, Sat in the in the Warwick control room, offering a half an hour slots for various interconnectors or, or producers. But the understanding I have um, around that is is very intricate. Um, you may recall in the news, uh, it's a little while, maybe six months ago, um, that there was a trip which almost put London into a blackout, and that was due to. Um, uh, national grid regulated business having an issue at one of their stations, but they thought it was due to uh, the Hornsey wind farm coming on and offline. Um, actually, it wasn't in the end, but part of that was because of the, um, the fact that, as you say, generators are coming on, coming off much more frequently than what they used to, and certainly in different parts of the UK. Uh, we're not the only country that struggles with the power generation location versus where the demand centers are. Germany is the same and they've actually got large onshore DC systems now being constructed to take the power from the North Sea uh, down towards Bavaria, for example, where it's another big uh, heavily industrialized area which requires lots of power. So they're having to reinforce their grid that way. The only thing I can say about reliability is that different countries have different strengths. So, for example, we would ask three interconnectors to France. A lot of their base load is still nuclear with EDF. So we're not importing their wind power, which is also um, up and down. We are would typically be then drawing on their nuclear capability. Uh, I would see that moving forward. Obviously, they're producing their own wind more and more as well. They've got five to six projects on the go at the moment. One in Dunkirk, San Jose, places like that too. I think it's safe to say that the more interconnection, the more reliability there will be around the fact that when the wind's not blowing in the North Sea, it's blowing in the Southern North Sea. Or if the sun's not shining in the UK, it's shining in Denmark and it's shining in Germany. Um, one thing, one company is trying to negate that entirely with its reliability, which is a company called uh, Xlinks. And they, you may have heard of it, it's a project that is a solar generator out of Morocco with then cable systems running back up to the southwest and coming into And that's 3,200 kilometers of East DC again. But of course, you know, it's in terms of um, 
the, the reliability of the solar production in the time frames that you've got on a daily basis, that's much more reliable than, than the wind, for example. So some some companies are really trying to improve that level of robustness. Because battery storage isn't there yet. And hence the discussion we had earlier around hydrogen and uh, projects that are called power to X, where excess power that's being generated uh, almost freely because there's not the demand can be used to generate hydrogen, which can then be used to um, provide power at a later date rather than battery storage as a storage solution. The issue that is, is the losses. You're generating power to then use power to make hydrogen, and you're losing power energy when, when converting it back again. But part of the part of the mix in the future, hydrogen, ammonia, everything. I can only see it going north, in all honesty. I think that the, yeah, um, the power demands in the UK are going up and up. And in terms of consumerism going in that direction, uh, it won't be long before I suspect we'll connect North America as well, and in that direction as well. Exactly that, and sometimes even if it's only partly sunny everywhere, the, the one hour difference when people are putting the, putting the tea on makes, makes a difference, and, and you can see that in that simple loading of daily basis. Okay, thanks very much, appreciate your attendance and your active questions, that's been really lovely, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much.